So before we begin, I kind of want to define what I do here. And I want to start by this very detailed drawing of how planet scale works. Um, this is a very, you know, in our infrastructure, we have obviously at the core of things, we have MySQL. There's some other glue in here that makes everything work. And then there is this layer that I call edge. And I want to call this out because edge is kind of different for everybody and in different contexts. But for us, and, and for me specifically, edge relates to the outermost part of our network. So this is the edge of our network. It is if you are connecting to a planet scale database, if you are running SQL, doing anything against the actual MySQL database, you go through edge. So this is you, this is all of you. Um, some of you are very close to us, as in you might have your servers in the same data center. And ideally you would provision, say you, you, you run your stuff in AWS US East. Uh, you also provision a database in US East and you're kind of next door to, to us. And that's kind of the ideal situation for most of our customers. But there's also a good amount of you, believe it or not, that are far away from our databases. And, I, and by far, I mean geographically far. Um, so this might be, for example, you running something on your laptop and you're, you're doing some data analysis or, or something like that. Or, which is a little bit more common, you might be using a serverless thing where you don't actually know where your stuff is. You've just kind of thrown it out into the internet and the internet is just, you know, do, doing its computation. And all of that is now phoning back home to, to us. So these are kind of two very distinct, different problems that we need to deal with. Um, and we don't want to really be harmful to either of those. So if we do optimizations for the people that are far away, we obviously don't want to degrade the experience for the people that are very close to us. Uh, this specific layer, uh, so this is wrapping all of our MySQL. This is Edge. Edge is responsible for uh, kind of our, our API, I guess we, we can call it. Uh, this API is for directly interfacing with our database. Typically, this is something that you use with SQL. It is responsible for authentication. Uh, so when you, you know, have credentials, you talk to us, we, we're not just exposing MySQL directly to the internet. That would cause a lot of problems. So we have to have this shim layer of kind of our planet scale sauce that, you know, doesn't just, just here's a MySQL socket on, on the internet. So me personally, I care a lot about performance. Um, I care about your experience. I care about fast applications. For the most part, we can kind of say that everyone here probably cares about running queries against the database. You care about things being quickly. You probably run some sort of web application, hit or miss. They all kind of at the same, at the end of the day, you want things to be fast. That's kind of the sales pitch of our product is that we can, we can, we can scale really, you know, large and we can also maintain being fast. But as a software engineer working on this layer, there's only so many things I could do. And if you can tell that is a very sad face of mine that I would like to do so much more. But within the scope of my responsibilities, you can tell me rewrite it in Rust. You can tell me, you know, make this algorithm more efficient. You can make the computers faster. But at the end of the day, there's different orders of magnitudes of when it comes to performance. A lot of what I do and a lot of my optimizations are in the nanoseconds to microseconds world. I have a lot of control when it comes to that. If someone tells me, hey, make this algorithm not ON, that is usually, for the most part, typically in like a microseconds or nanoseconds layer. But the real issue is the milliseconds. And that's generally, for the most part, what we can't control. My entire stack of software executes well under a single millisecond. So any kind of incremental improvements we make, uh, 
generally are in single digit microseconds, nanoseconds. These are important for us because when you, when you think about doing database access, doing a select one is very fast. <laughs> so adding on a millisecond of latency to a select one is very noticeable. It's less noticeable when you are talking from Europe, talking to a US database, that millisecond isn't gonna be noticeable, but it is gonna be noticeable if you're in the data center uh, or in the same data center or data center next door. But I can't control that path. That's, that's either clients, that's your internet connectivity, that is your ISP, that is your data provider. Um, that is out of my hands. So where this kind of comes together is our database has an API. And I kind of want to separate the concern that this is a, an API for the database layer, not for managing our managing the product. So it's a little, a little bit different line here. So this is how I'm going to get access in and out of, of our database. So we have two of these APIs. The first one is a, is a pretty obvious, uh, you, you interface with MySQL. And by that, I mean explicitly the MySQL protocol, not necessarily MySQL, the database as an API. We run MySQL database, but the protocol is its own separate thing. This is what you get if you are using, let's let's say Python, for example, and you you install the, you know a MySQL client package, use the MySQL CLI tool, you're gonna be communicating through uh, the MySQL protocol. So we all know this. You might not know it to a level of, of how I actually write MySQL protocol or what the packets look like, but it's really an RPC API. Like there's nothing really too fancy going on. It has a, uh, honestly, a series of commands. Like for example, the common one is com query, and that is its own structured binary packet. You can send com query, and that is how you send along SQL. It's a really easy thing, especially for to to implement. Uh, you just open up a, a TCP socket, and you just put some bytes on it, and you expect to get some bytes back. It's its own unique thing. Uh, the one thing I want to point out it is that it is a stateful protocol. So a good majority of you are probably aware that you open up many connections and you need to you know typically manage some sort of connection pooler. And a lot of the state of your connection, so transactions, session variables, things like that, are tied to that open connection. So if at any point, if that connection is severed, the state that is maintained with that connection is lost. So if you were executing 10 queries, it got through and you, you ran through five of them and then you have a network interruption, uh, depending on what you're doing, if you have, or within a transaction, things like that, you've lost your session. Maybe some of it's half committed. Uh, it, it, it's really kind of, you know, for the most part, indeterministic from my point of view here. So the other API that we have is HTTP. This is the language of the internet. Whether we like it or not, it is pretty ubiquitous, just in existence, it's everywhere. But you probably didn't know that we have this API. Um, it's not a RESTful API, so it's not something that you're, you know, what you would traditionally find. It's, it's very different from our API to manage our product. It is specifically designed for interacting with a database. And one nice thing about it is it is stateless. So in this case, your state is not tied to the actual connection. So similar to how you interact with a browser session on a website, you're logged in, you might bounce to, you know, your connection is gonna go away, but you're not logged out. Um, so HTTP kind of is inherently stateless in that case. People also really like this thing called JSON or JSON, however you want to pronounce it. I like to say JSON, but I think it's wrong. But it's a thing people like to do. It's really easy to interop with. You can write JSON by hand. It doesn't require you to, to implement parsers. It's, it's just a very known structure, which means it interops with other languages very, very well. It works with curl, so it's really nice. In our case, it's kind of convenient. You can just uh, 
command line, just run something with curl and, and work with JSON if you needed to. Where things get interesting is that it also supports gRPC. And if you're not very keenly aware, um, gRPC is transported over HTTP. So it's kind of a, it's not its own thing. It's kind of another layer of, of a format on HTTP. So we kind of get that, I don't want to say for free, but it's, it, it, it works with us and it's very complimentary. This is all undocumented because this is all pretty new. Just FYI, I fully plan on getting this documented very, very soon, but it's, it's complicated, but we're getting there. So right now though, everyone is using MySQL. I hope that's going to change. I have selfish reasons as an infrastructure provider why why this would be nice, but for the most part, like it, it's not going to go away. No matter what, I, we can't. We're never going to convince people to be like, hey, you're going to adopt this bleeding new, you know, vendor lock-in tech. It's just not going to happen. We have to provide compelling reasons. So at some point, we might be able to convince people to do it if we can sell them enough reasons to say, this is objectively better. Here's what you're getting. But for now, it, it's never going to go away. We have to support the MySQL protocol. But maybe someday, that's something that we can, we, we can pull off. So here's where I'm going to rant a little bit. Uh, so as a service provider, MySQL is not a very good thing for us to support. So starting with stateful connections, as a service provider, your, 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 all of your session information is tied to that individual connection you have, which means we have no capability of disconnecting a connection that you have open. If we do, that is very disruptive to a majority of people's applications, depending on what clients they use. In some cases, it's not that bad, but for the most cases, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's disruptive. So what that means for us is like we, it makes it hard for us to deploy software. We can't easily restart things like you, you, you typically could. All of this can be summarized by it's not HTTP. And I kind of mean that, I don't mean that HTTP itself is superior. The ubiquity that came with HTTP just kind of gives the ecosystem a lot of these tools and it's meant to handle very lossy scenarios, um, things going up and down. If we want to add new servers, remove servers, deploying code, it, it's relatively non-trivial with MySQL. My favorite personal part is clients, once they have a MySQL connection because everything is stateful, they literally never disconnect. Um, some do, some connection poolers are a little bit more kind and say, you know, every hour, maybe it'll recycle connections. But in a vast majority of cases, once a client has opened up a TCP connection, it kind of assumes it's never going to go away. And a lot of these assumptions are because you are running your own MySQL server. And the only reason why you would disconnect is like, I've restarted the server or done something disruptive. There's not typically some layer in between like us where we need to deploy software and, and do more of like continuous deployment on. Um, but clients never disconnect, which is, which is tricky for us. Because all of these stateful connections, there's a lot of them. Uh, those of you that do any large scale web application are pretty aware that you kind of need a unique connection per parallel request that's happening. So you, you tend to have applications that have hundreds of connections, dozens of connections at minimum, just to be able to handle the throughput throughput because each individual connection is its own state. Nothing can be multiplexed over it. it, it, it it's its own thing. Uh, and the last one is, is a little bit unique in that the TLS support for MySQL is kind of weird in that it's something that we have to support, but it uses this thing called start TLS, which is a, basically what that means, there's a different things, there's a few different things that implement start TLS, but it's a way for MySQL to have port 3306 standardized and serve both encrypted and unencrypted traffic. In our case, as a service provider, we don't want to do unencrypted traffic. We want to only give TLS. 
But the way the Cert TLS works is there's an initial handshake that's unencrypted. And then after those few bits, we say, hey, we require encryption. And it's up to the client to also say, I agree with this. And then you negotiate the TLS handshake. But what that means is because of that behavior, it mitigate, it eliminates the ability for a lot of other software to help us. We can't offload TLS. We can't do anything. Like we have to own all of this because we also have to own the MySQL handshake. So we didn't invent the HTTP stuff just for fun. We didn't do HTTP necessarily to solve this problem. Ha supporting HTTP by itself doesn't necessarily get us more customers. It doesn't, they're, they're just difficult software engineering problems for us to solve. But some of our product demands were wanting to extend the capabilities of MySQL. So the two that I'm gonna call out are serverless, so whether you use them or not, it is a decent amount of our customers and platforms such as like Vercel, Netlify, Cloudflare Workers, whatever. All of those like edge compute things, they tend to have a lot more uh, restrictive environments in which they run. And they don't just want you to open up. You can't just run a TCP. You can't just open up a TCP socket and do whatever you want to anything on the Internet they limit the functionality to basically HTTP. And when we want to augment new features, it's not very trivial for us to just add on to the MySQL protocol. While technically we can add new of those like basically RFPC commands and add on new packets and add all this stuff, we're kind of at the same problem in that we now have to ship a modified MySQL client for you to be, and then like, how do you access it? You know, it's not necessarily SQL. So this kind of leads to, to being fetch API compatible. If you're not very familiar with the web, fetch API has kind of become the browser standard for a JavaScript API for making uh, HTTP requests. So basically it's this, this just interface. A lot of things implement it. Um, be, for us being able to support AP, the fetch API opens up the door to a lot of different stuff like serverless or even from the browser directly. And we chose for adding new features, we wanted to be able to support gRPC because gRPC is a pretty common thing. If you're using um, a lot of like Google services because gRPC came from Google, all, are all kind of just natively gRPC and you're not particularly aware of it. It's just what, what they happen to use for transport. So, so why is gRPC interesting to us and, and where does that fall in here? So gRPC combines uh, this thing called protobufs or protocol buffers and HTTP2. This is all nicely on top of TCP and HTTP. Uh, gRPC is just kind of a specification for how to, you know, similar to like a REST API or something like that, it's just its own structure of how to make calls. But for the most part, if you're, if, if you just wanted to interact with gRPC, you don't have to have like a gRPC client. You can just use HTTP and shape a request to match. Protobuf is where things get a little bit interesting with that, in which the data that is transported can be sent encoded via Protobuf. And Protobuf is, a format for it's a definition for how to pack arbitrary structures into bytes. So similar to how the MySQL protocol has a com query, you know, whatever, in theory, those could be defined as protobufs and have a kind of a uniform way to encode and decode those structures. And that's kind of what protobuf gives us as just a generic API. So similar to like JSON, we can use protobuf but we get a binary format instead of this plain text JSON. So this is the only slide I promise that has hex and, and raw binary, but I want to make the point of what this kind of looks like on the wire, because there's a lot of preconceived notions of, of doing it this way is, is worse. So if we just kind of look at a com query packet in MySQL, and compare it to what the protobuf encoded version of our what we have is a 
execute request, which accomplishes the same goal. We can actually see that the protobuf one is shorter. And but between both of them, what dominates it is the actual payload. And, and this could be the same for basically all the packets. It's, it's both on a response, you're usually getting back many, many rows, and the padding and overhead of the actual protocol is, is for the most part, minimal compared to uh, the actual payload or even just queries. So the only thing that makes this not a one-to-one -one comparison is because on the protobuf side, we are ignoring the HTTP2 and the gRPC part of it. And there's kind of a reason for that. Um, it's a lot more complicated to just kind of give an example of what it is because of the way that HTTP 2 and 3 work. It's not a one-to-one -one, like here is the payload, here is what you're going to get out. HTTP 2 and 3 kind of optimize and improve headers as it goes along. So the longer you have a connection open, it will, it kind of like compresses and, and optimizes a lot of stuff away. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing and you know, it's not worth getting into the details there, but it kind of just goes away uh, in a lot of cases. So HTTP 1 was, was text-based and that's kind of where a lot of these, these preconceived notions came into play is that, you know, HTTP is very slow and bloated and, and just very quickly, this is why, you know, when we think of HTTP, this is what we see. This is kind of what your browser shows, even if you're using HTTP 2. But for the most part, you got the, you know, you got the, uh, you got key value stuff. They're separated by colons. You got a bunch of metadata. It's not an easy format to parse. Um, it's got a lot of bloat. None of this exists in HTTP 2 or 3. HTTP 2 is binary and not a plain text thing. But we get a lot of really cool stuff because of this. So it's not just to do binary format. They've kind of superseded a lot of use cases of things like WebSockets and that we've introduced bi-directional streaming. So you can have one, one connection and both client and server could be sending RPC streams back and forth. We have multiplexing, so we can handle multiple concurrent streams over one actual physical connection. HPAC is the uh, the binary encoding of headers, which is it's it's genuinely pretty wild. A lot of header compression happens, and it can get down in a lot of cases to one or two bytes um, per header pair, as opposed to parsing and splitting you know ASCII text. Uh, HTTP2 also brings along TLS 1.2. And this is kind of important because web technology tends to push a lot of the boundaries with security and, and that kind of tech. And when we're talking the MySQL protocol, a lot of that is used on internal traffic. So it's not as battle tested with, with staying up to date with the leading you know, technology for TLS. You can do it. There's nothing that prevents it. Just in practice, using TLS with MySQL is hard because it's not the common case. Whereas browsers these days, especially, is default uh, TLS everywhere. So we we just recently got HTTP two, but now we got this really interesting thing called HTTP three, and it's not super common. It's this is excessively bleeding edge. Um, and a lot of it's bl excessively bleeding edge because it took basically a lot of what it learned from HTTP 2. So a lot of the header compression and all of that, the binary, all of that is pretty similar. But they decided to tackle the worst part about HTTP, and that's TCP. And to be clear, TCP is also what MySQL uses. So the same issues that HTTP 2 have or HTTP before three have the same issues over the MySQL protocol. So such things as like packet retransmitting, uh, head of line blocking, those kind of things are just inherently issues with TCP. So for example, if you drop a packet, all the other packets on the network have to wait or on that socket are waiting until you know the one is retransmitted. And if 
if you're on high latency is when these get really, really bad. So HTTP kind of tack you went to tackle this and they decided to not use TCP and they kind of built this new thing on top of UDP. And there's a gut reaction to UDP. If you're not, you know, real familiar is that UDP is lossy. So how does this work? And so instead of just saying it's on top of UDP, they've created another protocol called quick. Uh, QUIC and quick is intended to replace TCP. So if you think about TCP, TCP is built on top of an unreliable network. It, it has physical things underneath it. It has a physical ethernet wire, you know, down the layers, network packets can be lost, but TCP provides that reliability on top of raw, you know, ethernet packets and stuff like that. Quick is is the analogous and it's it accomplishes that in a very different way to more accommodate modern Internet. TCP was created in the 70s. A lot of things have changed in 50 years with networks, network performance, network reliability. We use them very differently. So Quick has attempted to solve that. Quick also integrates with now a newer version of TLS called TLS 1.3. And following the trend of web kind of pushing bleeding edge tech, TLS 1.3 entirely shakes up how to do a TLS handshake to a server. So typically, if you think about the, you know, there's like this multiple handshake of like, hey, I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And with TCP, you got the SYN, SYN act, you know, all, all that whole handshake. When you're very in a latent network, all of that takes a long time. If you're 20 milliseconds away, it's going to take you at minimum 60 milliseconds to establish a connection through the handshakes. So TLS and Quick are a unit. As a part of establishing a new Quick connection, the TLS handshake goes with it. It is not a separate do TCP connection, do the TLS negotiation. They are they are one. It is inseparable. With TLS 1.3, it also has this really cool new feature called zero RTT, which is zero round trip. Meaning it can reestablish a connection to an existing something it has seen before without doing any handshake. You just you connect and you're there. So this kind of so kind of thinking about the broader picture is that now that we fundamentally have an HTTP API, can we start mixing these things together? And like HTTP three kind of goes, you know, once you have HTTP, we can kind of just use this stuff for free. It doesn't require a lot of effort for us to just use a newer version. Um, it, it, and we kind of get all those nice things. So I started experimenting. What if we combine the niceness that we got from gRPC and requiring protobuf as the as the wire format and pairing that with http3. So now from here we basically have a very light efficient protobuf encoded version of our of our requests and responses and now over a lighter weight actual transport protocol. And this is something that MySQL cannot do because it is based on TCP. So I kind of started theory crafting here and th this is genuinely was just like, I wonder if this can be better at this point, like doing with when everything was based on TCP, it didn't seem as appealing to kind of dig in and see if we can do better, given that I know the downside is TCP. I know that we can't, you know, if you are, are an unreliable network, there's only so much we can do. But now with HTTP 3, I started thinking, can we actually, if we were to build a driver on top of, uh, on top of HTTP 3, could we be comparable? And it's, it, it's a low bar. I didn't want to be worse. Um, so kind of my thought process here was that the protocol overhead is negligible at this point. We got super fast networks, you know, especially you're in AWS, you got some 10 gigabit pipe that just basically is plugging into us. 
send you know being even though http2 is pretty efficient over the network it does have some extra bloat it, it's it's negligible though on this scale if we're adding an extra even a hundred bytes or a kilobyte per payload back and forth it's dwarfed by the amount of data and an extra hundred bytes over a super fast network is it's it's not a thing that is a concern these days network latency dwarfs all of this stuff um, if you have a network hiccup if you are not in the data center next door you have a five millisecond ping to us you have a hundred millisecond ping to us all of this is substantially larger when it comes to uh, performance than uh, adding an extra few bytes on the wire tls is slow using a mysql client it's hard to get the modern tls's it's hard to get TLS 1.3. You can do it, but again, kind of leading the trend of using web technology, that kind of leads the, the, the race here, especially if we can adopt quick, that mandates the um, TLS 1.3. And like it or not, even if HTTP isn't the most efficient protocol, it is so scrutinized. HTTP is so efficient to parse even the text-based protocol is so much faster than a lot of binary protocols just because it's so scrutinized and so heavily used i think of http like json people are always trying to squeak out performance out of json just because json is so ubiquitous not because json is a better format it's just so heavily used so it's scrutinized so to me now that I was kind of looking at this, I was like, well, what, what if, what if I did write a driver? What if I played with this? What, what would I claim as success? And to me, I like to set low bars on things. I like to, you know, it's hard and disingenuous to think that I can do better in a lot of cases than my SQL. Like you, you run a select one, it happens in microseconds. There's not a lot of room to make that more efficient. You gotta send the string select one. You gotta, like th there's a minimum amount of work that needs to be done without a lot of bloat. So to me, I just didn't, like if I can be comparable was pretty cool. And that to me seemed like a pretty, pretty good result. Cause at that point, there's not a reason not to do it. There just might not be a reason to do it. So I didn't want to go into a ton of the, the, the all the individual benchmarks. I, so the blog post that we have that accompanies this went into a bunch of them in a lot more detail. Uh, but I wanted to call out two of the test results that I thought were the most interesting. And I say that because to me, they were actually pretty interesting in the other results that were the same. <laughs> And that's interesting because we just matched the MySQL protocol in my testing. The ones that didn't match are, are not necessarily what I expected. So I had hunches. So the connect and select one test case was one that I had a very big hunch that, because uh, that's where the new TLS comes in. Because you're worse. So this test was establishing a new connection and running a select one and disconnecting. It's a very extreme edge case. It's not something that is very practical in your application. Most people fire up a connection pool. So it's kind of easy to counteract this and be like, hey, I, I don't really care. This isn't, this isn't really doing much for me. But it was an extreme case to kind of test that part of the protocol. And while it might not be important for you or a lot of people, this does become relevant in serverless stuff, or if you're running on like AWS Lambda, you have the, the boot up cost time of, of getting started. So these do become pretty relevant in those cases. And as we can see, um, we're pretty drastically improved on both HTTP 2 and 3. And that's only because the MySQL client is doing TLS 1.2, and the other two are doing on TLS 1.3. We don't see much of a gain uh, between HTTP 3 and HTTP 2. Um, for the most part, I would say that those are not scientifically uh, different. Um, where 
it kind of came interesting was a large select. So this was me kind of stress testing the a large, you know, I think it was like 50 megabytes or something of data that's basically being downloaded. I did a similar upload test, which at that point I started to also stress the MySQL database and the disks and stuff like that, which it was a pretty good result as well in that the protocol wasn't getting in the way. What I find interesting that I wanted to call out was that on the high latency network, is where HTTP3 kind of shines. Oh God, I missed this slide. <laughs> so um, HTTP kind of Excel or uh, quick specifically is what excels on the high latency, large amount of data networks, which makes sense. Um, Cause now at this point we're, we're trying to send 50 megabytes over the wire. Uh, and yes, to answer that question, it is, this is using protobuf. So this was trying to be the most refined version. Obviously, if we're using JSON and things like that, there's going to be a little bit more compromises, but this was trying to be the, you know, as as efficient as we can. So HTTP3 in this case is where this starts shining. When you're sending 50 megabytes over a network, over a high latency network, and this is a large geographic region, there's a lot of network switches, there's a lot of things involved. If it drops a packet, you can pretty quickly see that things get slower pretty pretty quickly. So having HTTP three there was a was a big success. What was kind of this is the only test, the only test in anything I've done where HTTP three was universally worse than both HTTP two and the MySQL protocol. So this was on a low latency network. This is literally in the same AWS data center as where the database was. So we tried to remove everything, you know, that's removing all network hops as much as we can. And what I, my theory here, HTTP3 and Quick specifically are still very immature. They're not, you think about TCP, TCP is built into the kernel. It's been around since the seventies. We're really at this point stress testing the implementation of quick and i find it very sh hard to believe that this won't improve over time i would imagine and i didn't get into actually running like profiles and things like that but my guess is we're actually losing um cpu clock cycles to actually parsing quick um but that'll improve but other than that we can still see that http2 which is something that we can use today is still, uh, that was shockingly better. So my summary of this was that in every scenario I tested, HTTP2 with HTTP3, with the caveat of that last example, it was comparable and better in a lot of cases. And what this kind of meant to me was that like, if we were to write an H a driver today that was, you know, the planet scale MySQL driver and you were able to plug it in with like an ORM or use it in your existing application and you just use it and you don't have to know that it was uh, not using the MySQL protocol, you're not going to degrade in performance. In a lot of cases, we can give you an improvement, but why I emphasize being comparable is that that makes it a drop-in thing, even if you are on a low latency and you don't actually have the problem set that it is improved. If you open up a connection and never disconnect it, like if these aren't problems to you, using something based on HTTP2 wouldn't be a downgrade. It would just be a lateral movement. But if you are in those scenarios, we can say we improve as well as not being worse in anything else. If it was worse, now you'd have to make a decision because you're making a compromise, but it's not. And that was kind of what was a little bit more shocking to me in that uh, there's basically no compromise, at least getting into HTTP2. So, so now we're left with, you know, what do we do now? We've, we've done these experiments. Uh, that's cool, Matt, but what, what do I do with this? And honestly, there's not a lot. So outside of our own product development, um, we're, we're definitely going to build new features that use the HTTP2 protocol because we need gRPC. 
we're going to be experimenting with writing drivers based on HP2 or 3. We're going to see where that goes, but it's not something that you're just going to roll in today and be like, hey, let me just let me just fire this up and, and get, you know, double the performance. That's that's not going to happen. The coolest side effect that I find from this was within our product, we have a MySQL console. This MySQL console, and this isn't explicitly because of HTTP3, but just in general because of having an HTTP compatible API, we directly communicate from the browser to the database using our API. And because you're using it in a browser, modern browsers will support HTTP3 and you kind of get it for free. In this case, it's not really going to buy you anything because you're typically not doing large data processing and things like that. But it's kind of a way for us to experiment and, and see what our downsides are before we committed to other stuff. But it's something that we kind of get for free. So the downside to this is that HTTP 3, because it comes with a whole new, effectively a whole new um, networking stack of quick and UDP and all of that, it is very rare to find implementations of this. It is very new and the demand really isn't there on server stuff. So outside of browsers, it's really hard to find. Honestly, it's also kind of hard to find HTTP2. So this is kind of an upward hill if we wanted to actually lean into HTTP3. But I kind of hope this is like a chicken and egg thing. If we can provide a compelling reason and say, hey, if uh, like Vercel, if, if you want to support communicating via HTTP3, I'm willing to help you make this happen, but it's going to make your customers also a lot faster because especially in that case, it's going to have a little bit higher, higher latent um, connection because they're distributed all over. But fortunately, the conclusion here, HTTP2 was also really good. And HTTP2 is quite a bit ubiquitous. Um, so being gRPC compatible kind of opens up the door that if you want to use a, or if we wanted to write a gRPC client, that is very prevalent and, and very available. And the fact that HTTP2 gives us a good amount of the benefits, um, that's something that we can explore today without needing to go too far and drinking the Kool-Aid of, of getting all into HTTP3. But keeping HTTP3 in mind for future adoption is kind of what, uh, what I hope most. So to me, the future is interesting. There, there's, we, we haven't really tapped into all of the things that we can do with this. We haven't you know, written drivers. We haven't gotten out there and said, hey, uh, I want to work with you to get Cloudflare workers to use HTTP3 or, or whatever it would be. We, we haven't had a compelling reason. So part of these experiments were to kind of get in front of that chicken and egg thing and then say, hey, like, we, we can measurably improve this situation with no downsides, uh, or at least for the most part. UDP comes with its own stuff. But for the most part, there, there's no real downsides if, you can, if your infrastructure can handle it. So we kind of need to see where this can go. We're, we're not getting rid of it. Um, we're planning on documenting the APIs. And when I say gRPC compatible, I'm, a, I'm being very intentional on that, that we support more than just gRPC. For example, using our web console does not use gRPC from the browser. It is just using JSON. So the API is going to be fully compatible with using JSON, which does make it really easy if you're not in a performance critical situation. You could just use some JSON. Like if I want to curl from command line, I can do that because I don't need to write a protobuf or binary encode, you know, through something to be able to send that payload. So we're going to keep exploring and seeing what we can do. Um, I would fully expect at some point for us to publish some experimental libraries that directly speak over the uh, our new HTTP APIs, whether that is HTTP two or three. It's probably going to be language dependent. Like if you're using a Ruby application, for example. 
good luck getting an HTV3 client. Like it's, and I'm not writing it. <laughs> um, so it's kind of interesting to see see where this is gonna go. Um, it's been fun. So yeah, so I'm 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 down to answer anything. I'm pretty at least try. I'm not the most knowledgeable, but you know, I've I've written a lot of this stuff, I've written a lot of this code, I've played around with it a lot. It's been fun. Yeah, so I guess we'll, we'll start with the first thing. So I want to address one person asked about uh, packet loss with, with UDP. So I think I, I, I touched on that. Um, that that is, has been the probably the number one concern that someone has brought up and been like, hey, you know, I hear that UDP is going to lose, lose my data. Um, and that's true. But so does the wire that you plug into your computer. There's always data loss on the protocol. The whole point of TCP is to make it reliable. So TCP is its own wrapper around raw network bytes. And that wrapper is what gives sequence numbers and all these other things so that the other side knows and like, hey, I missed a thing, re-give me the thing that I missed. Or it, it, it is the structure for the unreliable data. So if we think about the same analogy, UDP is that primitive in, in this case. UDP is the, is the lossy primitive. UDP is just sending some stuff. You don't know if they got it. There's no acknowledgement. There's no nothing. So in that sense, UDP is, is lossy. That's where QUIC comes in. So QUIC is that structured protocol that uses UDP as a primitive. And QUIC is what gives similar semantics to TCP in that with the same goal of reliability. So if you're gonna send a request, you will know that the requests got there in very similar semantics to TCP. So in the case of using it as a service or something with us, we're not just losing data. There, there's not things that are, um, we're not just losing queries, we're not receipt, you know, we're, we're, everything works as you would expect. Uh, Okay, so uh, so the API used in the Planet Scale console. So yes, so it's kind of clever how this works. I plan on writing a blog post a little bit more in detail about how our web console works because it was something that we we did very silently because it was experimental for us. It solved a lot of problems that we had. So the old way the console worked was. When you, when you fired it up, it would talk to our API server. So you'd basically make a JSON API request to our API server. Our API server is in US East, I believe. And then it would talk from our servers. It would get the credentials it needs and talks to your database wherever it is. So if you're in uh, let's, Europe, that's an easy one. If it's in EU West, you are physically in EU West. You already have a lot of latency talking to our API because you're going from US or EU West talking to US East. And then the US East server is talking to your EU database and then back all the way to you. So that's obviously a lot of latency if you're not in the US. So we wanted to solve the fact that, that it, it, and if you're in like Asia, it was entirely Un, unusable. So this became appealing because I was like, we can just let you talk directly to the database and not go through us because now we can talk to the database over HTTP. So the way that it works today, um, and you can kind of see what it's going if you, if you were looking at the network inspector and see what happens. On connect, we issue some short-lived ephemeral credentials. So part of all this is that the credentials can be stamped out for a minute, five minutes, you know, whatever short-lived. That is bound to your browser session. So you have to talk to our API to get credentials. The credentials stay in your browser and then they are refreshed just like an OAuth token uh, in the background. So while you're still on the page, it'll continuously refresh. If you leave the page, they expire. And then that is direct communication between uh, the database and 
and you, which is kind of nice because now it also doesn't go through our API servers, which is just less liability for us, you know, or just knowing that you're not sending, hopefully you're not just querying credit card numbers or something in, in the console, but you know, if, if you are, it's not going through another intermediate hop, it's directly talking to the database. I do plan on writing a bit about more about how that works because I think it's neat and we've used that as kind of this, uh, some, exp you know, a test bed for some of this stuff. Anyways, so benefits for highly concurrent workloads. I'm going to go down these lists. Uh, benefits of highly concurrent workloads in principle avoiding headline due to TCP should reduce long tail latency for multiplex streams. In simple terms, yes, that is the, um, so the benefit of being able to have one connection for everything kind of eliminates the MySQL like connection pool issue. This isn't necessarily an issue for everybody because some people just open up a connection pool of a hundred connections and then you just use those hundred connections. That's not the reality for everyone. Some people are creating a lot of connections, starting them up, tearing them down. But in the case of multiplexing, that's where quick comes in and solves some of the head of line issues uh, as opposed to TCP. And that's just something that you're really going to notice on latent networks. You, it's relatively rare if you're just in AWS talking to us next door. But yeah, having quick and stuff does solve that. It's a little bit harder to measure and quantify that because it does rely on the network being unreliable. So uh, it does just objectively improve things. Um, there. Are there places in the test to use this for internal traffic? So that's also an interesting question. So the test uses gRPC and that is correct. We communicate with the test internally, everything gRPC. We, we, for many reasons, we don't use MySQL connections in our internal infrastructure for a lot of the same reasons of what we're solving for public connectivity. It's just a pain. <laughs> We don't want to manage connection poolers. We don't want to have to deal with severing connections and all that. So we use the gRPC interface internally. The different, whenever we communicate with Vitesse is also within the same availability zone explicitly. So even in, in a US East one or whatever data center in AWS, we explicitly keep everything within a US East one A and follow that chain all the way through the stack. So the cases of saying, let's use HTTP three for this, it, it genuinely would not do anything because we're, it's not solving any of the problem. Like we don't have high latency networks. It wouldn't necessarily be worse, but it's also just not a problem on very reliable networks we keep hold open connections for a long time. So it's just not a, it's not a problem. We maintain, we can do TLS 1.3 internally. Like there's just a lot of things that we can do because we control that environment that it's just not that practical. The one thing I will point out, gRPC is very explicitly also bound to HTTP two. We cannot just use HTTP three with gRPC, nobody can. It, it's just not a, it's not a thing the libraries do, which is why I was calling out that we're gRPC compatible. When you use HTTP three, we kind of use a little deviation and which is why I kind of called out, it's just proto buff over HTTP three because we can't actually just use gRPC. You'd be kind of swimming upstream. There's nothing that prevents you from doing that just none of the ecosystem uh, really does it. So it's definitely not something we could just bolt into the test and say, hey, like, hey, let's use HTTP three now. So anything else for me? We are we are pretty good on time. I I, I nailed that. Uh, so the last thing is my only real marketing pitch, um, in that if you are not a customer, you should, you should definitely check it out. You should sign up. We're, we're continuing to try to make this stuff better. Um, 
I like seeing how we can push the envelope. I like challenging the assumptions of, of you know, preconceived notions. Uh, our serverless driver, which is what you would run in Vercel, use our HTTP API. It doesn't necessarily use HTTP 3. There's nothing that prevents it from using HTTP 3. That goes back to the support of providers. When you run this on Vercel, you're kind of at the mercy of what Vercel gives you as the fetch API. So maybe someday we can put enough pressure on the providers to be like, hey, can you make, can we get this to work on HTTP 3 and it's going to be faster. But anyways, for the most part, the serverless driver just, it'll use HTTP 1, it'll use HTTP 2, it just uses whatever that is HTTP compatible. Uh, Planet Scale Connect is the first feature that demanded an extension to our APIs or extension to the MySQL protocol. This is, if you're not familiar, this feature is, um, it supports like ETL. So if you wanted to change or if you wanted to change capture in real time rows that are added, mutated, all of that, shove that into something else. That was not a great, it's similar to like if you were writing your own thing that parsed and tailed bin logs and things like that. But we kind of want to make it a little more user friendly and that we can just hook into existing systems. That API is based on gRPC. We can have gRPC clients that interact with that API. And then I talked quite a bit, DN Browser MySQL Console. Outside of these things, there's not a lot of um, direct application today, but now that we have these primitives in place and we have things to play with, we're definitely planning on building new features and newer tech that's going to come out and, and leverage this. But for the most part, these are all, these are pretty cool things and it's all production ready. It's stable. Um, it's ready to use. Uh, we have, we have last question here. Late test, but did you run comparison against AWS Aurora serverless with the HTTP driver? I did not because I don't even really know what AWS Aurora is. <laughs> and I don't even, I'm not even entirely sure. Is that still available? I thought that was one they shut down. But either way, I, I haven't done a lot of comparison with different providers because I think that introduces a lot of variables. Um, a lot of variables that are not just testing the protocol. And that gets into, are we stress testing Aurora? Are we stress testing, you know, whatever else? It, it's not as controlled environment and it, it's hard to get tangible results out of that unless like I'm an Aurora expert and I'm, I'm not. Um, testing the protocol is kind of what I was trying to really focus on here, which is why like when I got into stress testing MySQL, I didn't want to just add capacity to MySQL or do, you know, planet scale shard things up and do things like that because it didn't, it didn't make sense. I'm really stress testing the protocol. If we're bottlenecked on the database, that's good. <laughs> means the protocol is not getting in the way. It's not slowing things down. Um, so comparing to other things to me just feels kind of moot because it's really comparing planet scale as a service being fast to AWS Aurora. Um, or measuring network latency. Like it could be Aurora has a closer region or a closer hop than, than where we are. It's just not a, it's, it's hard to get a one-to-one -one comparison. All right, well, I think, uh, I think it's good to go. Thanks, thanks everyone for wasting some time with me. It's been, it's been fun. Thanks a lot.